Hey everybody, welcome back to Remotely Serious. I'm Curtis Duggan, and my conversation today is with Jay Hunter Anson. He's the director of the Digital Residency Program in Palau. It's actually interesting. We may have discovered in talking with Jay that the Digital Residency Program in Palau may be one of the best, most effective digital nomad visa programs in the world. On previous episodes, we've talked about how certain digital nomad visa programs or remote work visa programs aren't the best or most flexible for digital nomads. And it looks like the program, of which Jay is a big part in Palau, is really nailing it. The, the criteria and how it works is something that I think will be of great interest to digital nomads and remote workers. So we'll talk about that program. We'll talk about Palau. And uh, yeah, let's jump in. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Remotely Serious podcast. This is a really exciting episode because I'm talking to someone that I've been following on Twitter and I've been listening to on other podcasts for quite some time. And it's Jay Anson, the director of the Palau Digital Residency Program. Jay, welcome to the show, first of all. I've been a big, big fan of yours for, I guess it's going on a year and a half. Hey, thanks a lot, Curtis. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here uh, and just share a little bit about my experiences and uh, what we're trying to do with the digital residency program. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's talk about Palau first of all. And for those that aren't necessarily familiar with exactly the geography of some of these countries in Micronesia or the South Pacific, I guess, is it fair to say, Jay, if you if you go north from New Guinea or you go east from the Philippines in the area of the Pacific Ocean, if you travel there a few hundred miles, you will find this archipelago of islands that is uh, the, the sovereign nation of Palau in that general area of the South Pacific? Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a fair uh, assessment. It's uh, I mean, if you if you spin the globe too fast, you'll you'll you will miss it. But uh yeah you, you can triangulate and, and find it we're an oceanic uh country so you know where whereas a lot of uh countries look at land mass we we kind of count our 300 uh mile uh ex- economic exclusionary zone uh out from uh the the uh land mass out out 300 miles and surrounding palau is uh considered you know part of our country so we're very uh, in tune and connected with the ocean. It's a big part of uh, our culture and our way of life. Uh, and so it's it's about the size of uh, maybe France or, or Texas, if you look at it that way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a great place to uh, it, it was a great place to, to grow up. And, and uh, I go back there as, as often as I can maybe two or three times a year. Uh, I'm getting to the point now where I'm, I'm, uh, ready to, to move back, uh, permanently, a uh, lot, lot of, uh, great developments, developments happening uh, in Palau right now. That's great. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely get into some of those developments. Um, I like to think about practical tips and, and actionable things that our listeners can do. We expect that a lot of digital nomads and r- remote workers or, digital nomad or remote work curious people are listening. So let's just, one more thing on, on Palau itself and the geography. Um, currently, what are the ways to get there? We want to make sure people can understand. Is it something where we don't we don't know exactly where everyone's coming from? In fact, our listeners are from all around the world. But are there certain places like Honolulu or Tokyo or Manila or um, Sydney that are the main hubs that you can get to Palau from? Yeah, sure. Direct, direct flights? Yeah, there. So there are. Uh, okay, so for for the longest uh, coming out of COVID, the first route to open up was uh, Guam uh, directly to Palau on United Airlines, and so uh, y- you would have to get to Guam. Uh, and then they opened up uh, Manila uh, to Palau, and essentially what the plane would do was go from Guam, stop in uh, Palau, drop folks off, pick folks up fly them to Manila and then turn around. It was kind of a uh, Airbus route, if you will. Uh, now uh, we have, and so that's the route I would take. So I, I'm, I'm in, I live in Florida, South Florida. So I'd go from Fort Lauderdale to Houston, Houston to Honolulu, about a 45 minute layover in, in Honolulu, just enough time to get some fresh Aloha air and then back in the airplane uh, to Guam. Uh, but now they have a route uh, 
uh, from Taipei directly into Palau. That's a little bit better route, so it, it connects uh, uh, just better connections for just all across Asia. Um, and uh, it lands at a better time too. It lands, it arrives in Palau uh, at five in the afternoon. The United Airlines flights uh, arrive after midnight. Uh, so that was, it was a little, a little bit challenging uh, in that sense. And then there's one more route that go, it, it originates in Brisbane, Australia, connects in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, and uh, then flies directly into Palau. Uh, so overall, we now have four routes uh, and there are, uh, there's a lot of great work being done by the, the, uh, uh, the president and, and the minister of tourism uh, to open up more routes, uh, looking at uh, Japan, probably Tokyo, and then Seoul, uh, South Korea, and Singapore. Got it. Yeah, and if people are listening and, and starting to get a picture of where Palau is, I think it's also incidentally interesting to point out that, uh, well, I was listening to, I guess I put it this way, I was listening to or reading an article about uh, U.S. geopolitical interests and uh, there was some kind of uh, agreement or compact that was signed with the United States. And so suffice to say, this is a part of the world that is very important and um, is essentially a, a geopolitical, um, I, I don't want to say hotspot. We don't want a hotspot. We don't want war. We don't want bad things. But it's a strategically interesting spot for the interests of the U.S. and the interests of China. And so it looks like Palau has been um, working on some publicly announced uh, agreements with the U.S. there. And so... Uh, when you when you think about connections to Guam and, and, and Taipei, um, it's certainly a, a beautiful part of the world, but also one that may might be in the news more and more. And you've certainly been in the news for your digital residency program as well. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I appreciate you uh, touching on that aspect of it. It is uh, we've we've been under uh, some some type of strategic relationship with uh, the United States uh, from a defense standpoint since the end of World War II, uh, first as a trust territory and then uh, up until gaining independence. And so we've, we've had several iterations of a, a compact of free association with the U.S. So U.S. citizens uh, can travel to Palau and stay up to a year and apply to stay longer if they wish and vice versa. Uh, Palauans are free to travel uh, and work uh, anywhere in the in the United States, and in exchange for that, um, we also get some uh, developmental dollars for to help with infrastructure, roads, ports, the airport, uh, et cetera. And then uh, the U.S. Uh, has basing and defense rights uh, internationally recognized uh, with Palau. Uh, so, in, in the event of uh, uh, different either technological or natural disasters, for example, uh, they can use Palau as, as a base of operation. Uh, God forbid if, if a, a war or something uh, were to were to happen, then uh, same same thing. Uh, the U.S. would would use Palau uh, for basing operations. Uh, there, there's a small uh, so there's there's a. Uh, uh, civic action team in Palau. I, I don't know the exact number. I want to say between maybe 40 and 50 uh, United States service members that are stationed there from across all, all the different services. And they do a lot of uh, uh, partnership cooperations with the local government and local law enforcement, uh, just training, uh, patrolling of the uh, economic exclusionary zone and uh, just different Different, different activities uh, to help with uh, security and, and uh, things of that nature. So you've got this uh, very, you know, beautiful location, beautiful culture, strategically important um, area that, that Palau is occupying. And yeah. now you have created this digital residency program. And it's yeah. something that I, I think it was Estonia that established the first brand for this years yes. ago, even before the pandemic in Eastern Europe, Estonia. I don't want to say, yeah, they, they, they pioneered. I'll say they pioneered the concept of someone who's not necessarily a citizen or a resident in the physical sense, not necessarily someone who's a, someone who got a visa to come get a job with a local employer, but just someone from outside of Estonia who wants to make use of certain 
Estonian services like setting up a corporation or banking with a bank remotely, perhaps coming to Estonia, but perhaps not spending very much time in Estonia at all. The Estonia e-residency or digital residency that, uh, has been around there for several years. What prompted Palau's entry into this, this concept? Because I, I think one thing, one more thing I'll say is this is slightly different than what we sometimes discuss, which is a digital nomad visa or a remote work visa, where someone establishes they have a certain income and then agrees to emigrate to a country like Croatia or Portugal or Costa Rica with a digital nomad visa, and then they come. They may or may not pay local income tax. Often they don't. Right. The Palau program seems to be something that's more global and portable and doesn't necessarily require emigration. And it seems like it's popular so far. Far I saw that you had surpassed 7,000 uh, uh, yes. appro approved applicants. Yes, so it he, seems like he, it's going well. Yes. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we are gaining some momentum as a, a lot of uh, people who, who've been interested uh, in the program are now seeing that it's it's kind of here to stay. It's been it's been uh, around for more than a year. We're we're getting a lot more government. Uh, it's a government. First of all, it's an official government run program. There's a law uh, that established the digital residency program. This isn't a private uh, entity's scheme or or business venture uh, or anything like that. So the uh, what well, what really what sparked the interest was with you know a, a lot of uh, Palauans and, and Palauan government leadership. You know they were, they were looking at what was going on uh, with Hong Kong and uh, other other financial hubs in that part of the world, right? So what and what they saw was you know there was a little bit of turmoil with with uh, and, and uh, uh, competition with China and and there was a lot of like new restriction, it was becoming more and more restrictive uh, to do business and and travel to and live in those different financial hubs. So they were really first looking at the fintech aspect of it, and maybe creating Palau, uh, building Palau up into a financial hub. They finally got a uh, Palau finally got a, uh, a fiber optic cable. They had been satellite based uh, for for so long. Uh, they, they finally got a satellite cable in 2015, or not, I'm sorry, a fiber optic cable in 2015. Uh, so they had high speed internet. Uh, they, they have a fiber ring that goes around the island. They're, they're in the process of uh, upgrading uh, the network. The Palau National Communications Corporation uh, has a grant from the United States to, to do that. Uh, and they have a second fiber optic cable that'll, that'll provide redundancy. So they really looked at it strategically and economically and said, you know, why not try to, to build this up, right? Uh, but then COVID, COVID happened. Uh, Palau immediately shut their borders to protect everybody. Uh, they, they were one of the few uh, countries that they, like during the height of the pandemic, there was no COVID uh, in Palau because they did that. Uh, but unfortunately, what that did was it, it, it negatively impacted tourism. You know, the tourism was uh, between 50 to 70 percent uh, of Palau's economy uh, between the uh, the entry visa fees, the uh, hotel uh, restaurants, uh, taxes that were collected. Uh, so re really, really uh, negative impact on Palau. The so so coming out of covid. Uh, you know the 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 blockchain and and uh, crypto and and those spaces were starting to to rock and gain more popularity. Find other uh, other innovations, other innovative ways uh, to diversify the economy. And so, uh, what our current president, President Whips, did was he he really dug in and did a a, a close study of what. What is involved with this? If you if you ever listen to his uh, his podcast and and some of the interviews where he's talking, about, he's very knowledgeable uh, about the industry and the innovation and the potential that it has, and and everything that can be done. So uh, they had a, a a couple of bills introduced, uh, and they were modeled after the Estonia e residency program. Uh, they, I mean, they, they just have a fantastic uh, program. They've been at it for years. Uh, it's it's another one that's that's there to stay. Uh, a lot of folks, when they come to the Palau, 
digital resident program, they don't find what, what they like, we absolutely recommend, hey, if you're looking for business registry or something like that, go to Estonia uh, or go to Federated States of Micronesia. They have a, a corporate registry uh, now. Um, but but I digress. So, so going back to uh, how it evolved, uh, we, we, we got the digital residency law in it passed. And then in uh, it took us a couple of months to get fully operational. But by February of, of uh, 2021, uh, 2022, uh, we had the, the program up and running and we were signing up digital residents. I, I didn't come on board until June uh, as the director. Uh, we had about uh, 700 digital residents at that point. Uh, and then we uh made some tweaks to the aml kyc uh uh software we were using uh just you know just tuning and, and make getting the program uh where it needed to be to really uh hit our pace with onboarding digital residents and and uh you know it's just slowly grown and and uh gained momentum uh, we're we're steadily seeing about uh between 25 to 50 uh, signups per day, and and we're working uh, in parallel to that to get the the marketplace uh, set with more ancillary services that digital residents uh, are looking for. Yeah, I'm seeing that the Palau ID is accepted by some brands that are on the RNS.ID website. Yes. California DMV, T-Mobile, Airbnb, Hyatt, CVS. Turkish Airlines, Costco. I love shopping at Costco. So that's that. That's great. It's it's not just something that's used to go to the bank in Palau or or go somewhere locally in Palau. There are these brands that are accepting it as a global globally accepted ID. Part of that seems to be these partnerships, or I, I shouldn't say partnerships, but these associations or um, memorandums with uh, the with with Web three entities or or crypto exchanges. And I know that. A couple of years ago, they were very popular. You list exchanges like Crypto.com and Kraken and BitMEX, Wise, the payments transfer company. These are all listed on your site. How has it been in the last few years where two years ago, it might have been very popular and unambiguously uh, seen as a sort of technologic, technology forward thing to associate with certain crypto companies in recent in the post FTX world and in recent times, yeah. certainly the United States SEC has gone after exchanges in the U.S. and and the the brand of certain crypto exchanges and Web three in general is maybe in a bit of a wane or in a bit of a winter period. How have you dealt with that? Where something that was very shiny two years ago in terms of a brand is now a little bit tarnished? Does that factor into your strategy? And and what overall is the um as the goal of associating this with with Web3 and blockchain technologies, as opposed to just having it in a Palau database on a server without any crypto, without any uh, blockchain, without any Web3, what's the strategy there? Yeah, so so the the, the strategy has always been the to to leverage the security of the blockchain, right? So so what a lot of folks uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, you know I I, I call them. Uh, so I was in the military and we used to call them barracks lawyers. You know, a lot of people who, who think they understand the technology and, and they, they, they go into these, the discord servers and uh, telegram chat rooms and, and they, they're just giving out really bad advice. Uh, yeah. Some of them are probably trolls. I, I don't know, but you know, they, yeah. so I, you know, I too, I too have encountered trolls on the internet. They're, the <laughs> yeah, they're, they're everywhere, but yeah. but yeah, I mean, there, there's, so there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of bad advice. So again, this is a government program, reach out to the government officials running the program. We, we have a, an excellent service provider uh, in cryptic labs that runs the RNS ID and they will give you the honest truth on what is possible and what's not possible. The problem is there are a lot of people who want to use the card to circumvent different things. And it's, it's really just not possible uh, at this point. Um, and, it, and it won't be because we have a lot of, you know, it's a government entity. Palau is a, a, a good steward of uh, regulations and laws. And so we're not looking at providing a service where you can circumvent the laws uh, and regulations of, of your own country. 
we're trying to provide a a, a globally accepted uh, identification and platform uh, so that you can do different you can you can have access to different services that maybe aren't available in your country. Uh, so for example, we're 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 almost done promulgating the mailing service uh, regulation. And so if you live in a country that doesn't accept Amazon or Amazon doesn't ship to, uh, you can get this mailing address and you can have uh, packages and, and letters and mail forwarded. Uh, you can have, uh, we, we wanna get to a point where depending on the success of, of that service, uh, do the digital scanning of people's mail and send it to them. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's faster, uh, cheaper, and uh, it's just more available uh, globally. And so does this work for the KYC? Is it such that if someone has gone through professional high standard KYC, pro- and maybe just for our listeners, KYC is an acronym that stands for Know Your, know your Customer which is in in the financial sector and in financial industries and in fintech industries, it's basically the idea that uh, you can't just give banking and crypto services out to anyone. Nations and states and jurisdictions will will regulate who you who can have uh, a checking account or a or a securities product or a stock brokerage, et cetera, et cetera, including with crypto. So, uh, getting back to KYC, so KYC know your customer. If someone has gone through the KYC process on Kraken or Wise or Crypto.com, is the process then that they can kind of uh, sign on through that or leverage that almost like you sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook to a website, the KYC they've gone through on Kraken and Crypto.com can kind of support their Palau application? Is that how you're leveraging the block? Is that one of these cases? Yeah, it's actually the the other way around. So those... Those platforms accept the Palau ID because I we, see, I see. We, Thank you. Yeah, we provide the KYC uh, service already. So if you if you uh, apply to one of those uh, uh, platforms with the Palau ID, they, there's already a memorandum of understanding that hey, they they they've accepted uh, our standards for due diligence and 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 know your customer and anti money laundering uh, screening. Uh, to and and so they'll it, it just it just makes it easier. Uh, so the the other thing with uh, with with the card, it, the, so there's there's we're we're uh, we we just finished beta testing uh, the NFT and there's a a, uh, a I guess a competition right now that we're asking for uh, artwork to design. We're asking for for NFT artists to design. Uh, what the digital ID will look like that that uh, has been extended to the 24th. Uh, so we're, lo- we're we're receiving submissions. We're, we're really excited. A uh, lot lot of great work is being submitted. But if you're if you uh, are listening and and you have an idea and and you want to design something and and send it to the RNS ID team, uh, we look forward to getting getting even uh, a larger portfolio of uh, artwork to to choose from. Uh, so there's the the digital ID and then the the hard copy, uh, you know, I, driver's license style uh, ID card and and that ID card uh, itself. There's if you go and, and Google anti counterfeiting technology that can go into a ID card, it's all in there from micro printing to the hologram to uh, just like all of the different the the chip. The, I mean, it's it's very very uh, secure and and just the latest technology uh, mm-hmm. is integrated into that card. So uh, that's that's another reason why it's it's accepted. It's all the security, uh, not just the then not just the 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 AML KYC, but the card itself. It, it cannot be counterfeited. Got so it. the the uh, the other thing was uh, for for the AML KYC. It's it's there's very strict laws in Palau. Uh, I, I had mentioned, uh, you know, that we had tried to, we, so we submitted two bills to Congress uh, back in the fall of 2021. One was the digital residency program. The other one was a corporate registry bill. That bill wasn't passed because it just didn't have enough AML KYC protections in it. The language was modeled after the Delaware 
uh, corporate laws and and you know it, again it's it's you know F, before FTX there was the thing called the Panama Papers where you know you started discovering like all these shell companies uh, that were uh, based out of Delaware and and so you know the Palau Congress didn't want to uh, want that to happen in Palau they're, they're very uh, cognizant of the dangers of AML KYC counter uh, uh, countering the financing of terrorism. Uh, that's that's definitely a high priority. Uh, so the the corporate registry bill is it's been going through a couple of uh, iterations of of uh, being redrafted. Uh, unfortunately, we've had like a turnover in, in legal advisors over the past year. But it, the the corporate registry bill is back with my office, and and I'm working with a paralegal to to redraft the outline. And we're get, we're modeling it after just like we modeled the digital residency program after Estonia's e-residency program. We're we're looking at uh, Federated States of Micronesia and the British Virgin Islands, uh, looking at their corporate registries uh, because they they have a lot of uh, AML KYC uh, digital assets um, things of that nature baked into their programs, and and it's it's exactly you know, the, the route we want to go. So until we get ours online, definitely check theirs out. Uh, if, if it works for you, along with the, the Estonia e-residency, uh, by all means, it's, it's, a, it's an entire community. And, and we're all just trying to uh, use the, the technology that's uh, in play now with the blockchain and everything to like, kind, of, kind of be more, more global and more remote. What is the ultimate goal or a second or third phase of success? A, a first phase MVP is definitely to build out the technology, make it you know high grade security, and then count the signups that are coming in, and that seems to be growing and growing. Is the is there an ultimate goal of this entire program to say have people come and get comfortable with Palau as a digital resident, maybe moving a mailbox or a bank account or using the ID for certain services like Airbnb. And then because they have this association with high quality services and a forward thinking technological program for, for governance in the ID, in the, in the residency program that they might move to Palau, start a business in Palau, become a taxpayer of Palau. Is it, thought of that way as a funnel for people eventually physically becoming a resident in the end? Yes. So yeah, yeah, I know that that's a, that's a great question. And, and that's, that's kind of exactly uh, where, what we're, what we're looking at. Right. So um, yeah, we started with the, the technology. I explained, you know, the technology and the card, we're using the blockchain, of course. Uh, our, our first regulation was a cybersecurity regulation you know, we wanted uh, digital residents and, and everyone involved or interested in the program to know, uh, hey, this is exact, it's spelled out exactly how we protect your data and what we do with it, uh, which is really, we store it. <laughs> we don't, we don't uh, do anything with it. It's, it's there as, uh, as a backup uh, to what's, what's located on the blockchain. Uh, and then there's, if you go on the RNSID website, they have uh, under the terms and uh, of uh, use, and there's it spells out exactly how they use the data to help provide better services, uh, really. But not, nothing is sold, nothing is uh, traded. We we do uh, penetration testing and vulnerability assessments of of all of our technology to make sure that it's it's safe and secure and can't be hacked or breached. So then, then the next the next thing we did is we took a look at Palau's immigration laws. Uh, there, so there's no path to citizenship uh, right now. Uh, the only way to be a citizen of Palau is by birth. Uh, so so we we took a look at okay what what are we doing for what what's there what what exists now that we can take a look at and maybe use to help digital residents. Uh, especially the digital nomad community. It's it's a huge uh, community of folks who, you know, I, I love that lifestyle of just being able to, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm in Croatia from May to August, uh, September, it starts getting a little chilly. 
by October, I want to go somewhere warm, uh, you know, pick up and go to Thailand or go to, uh, I don't know, Singapore. Why not come to Palau? Right. But the immigration laws didn't allow that. And, and there was no desire for like the golden visa program or, or we, we didn't want to make people prove that, uh, you know, you, you have hundreds of thousands of dollars income every year or you have ten thousand dollars in your bank account because then that's that's going to put a strain on the government to stand up those those uh programs right if, if you can buy a plane ticket to palau you have money it's it's not it's not that cheap uh, but at the same time if you get to palau you don't want to just stay there after spending all that money you probably don't want to stay there just for a week or two weeks you want to get you know the more bang for your buck uh, so that's where we, we thought digital nomads, you know, the, the way they, they operate, you know, work remotely, uh, it, it was a, is a perfect program to try and support. Uh, so we've amended the, uh, immigration regulations for Palau to allow digital residents who are digital nomads to, they can apply for up to two 90 day extensions past whatever their visa on arrival is and it varies from from country to country if if you're you have a japanese passport for example you can you, your visa on arrival is good for 30 days well now you can extend for 90 and if you want to stay longer another 90 uh if you're from you're from one of the european union countries it's 90 days so you know the same thing so you know european union you can potentially stay in palau Help me with my math. Yeah, 270 days. Uh, and then, you know, if you're from uh, uh, Japan, you, know, you can stay up to uh, 100. And, uh, so the, the digital residency yeah. program with this amendment uh, in combination with some baseline visa essentially means that uh, people can come to Palau, stay somewhere between uh, a month and even all the way up to what it sounds like six or seven months based yeah. on some of the baseline yeah, countries. Exactly. Yeah. And they can work from their laptop. That's yeah. legal. That's on side. And yes. they can um, and 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 they will not be subject to to income tax as well during right. their time there. Or will they be subject to income tax? If, if they decide to get a job in Palau, then you know they'll 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 pay Palau taxes. But if their their job, you know, they, they their job is in Germany and they're just living in Palau for six months, then they just pay whatever their country charges them. Yeah, you know, you know what I'm thinking, Jay, as I, as I listen to this, I think this is really the best digital nomad visa in the world, and I'll tell you why. Just the reason is because I don't know if you've been following this, but there's this debate about digital nomad visas and remote work visas. So I referenced them, I think, once already on this episode. But separate from digital residency programs, there are these digital nomad visas that are more like apply, give us your information, prove your income, and you can kind of quasi emigrate here. And when I say here, I mean, you know, it could be Croatia or Portugal or Costa Rica. Like I yeah. mentioned, there's, there's probably 30 or 40 or more like this. And it, right. but it's really, you know, it's about emigrating and moving from your home country, uh, cutting ties with your tax residency in your home country, whether let's say the UK or Canada or somewhere, and then right. coming over and resettling in Portugal on a digital nomad visa for one year. What digital nomads complain about is we really just want something that isn't about making a huge commitment for a full year. We want to be able to legally, like we used to be doing in a gray area, because that's what that's the that's what's the that's the elephant in the room in the history of digital nomads in the last six or seven or ten years is you know for a long time they were just doing it on tourist visas and right. hoping people look the other way. What yeah. digital nomads want, what I've had full, you know, a half of an episode talking with a digital nomad act advocate on this is like, we, we just want this to be simple. We want to come in. We maybe want to stay three or four months, but we, we don't want to have to worry about uh, committing for a year and then renewing for another year. Wow. This sounds like exactly what digital nomads keep saying they want the programs to be like. But if you examine some of the other South American, Caribbean, and European programs, they're not quite like this. They're more onerous. They're a little bit more of a commitment. And, and it, this seems to offer some flexibility to simply come in and out for 60 days or 90 days, obviously pending or based on whatever your, your baseline allowance is under, on the underlying law of Japan versus the EU versus right. Canada, et cetera. 
Yes, no, that that's exactly right. Uh, so so Palau is open to to all countries, with the exception of North Korea and Iran, uh, and and that's based on uh, you know Palau's a member of the United Nations, uh, and in our compact of free association, uh, we in in that sense because they're they openly support uh, terrorism, uh, that's why they're they're uh, blacklisted from Palau. But any other country. If you have a passport, you can fly to Palau and it visa on arrival. You don't have to go to an embassy and apply for a visa. You don't have to pay anything for a visa. You just buy your plane ticket, you arrive in Palau, and they will tell you how long your uh, visa on arrival is. And so with the digital residency program, if you are a Palau digital resident with a Palau digital residency ID card and your passport, you can fly to Palau. If you, you get there, you, you say your visa on arrival is good for 30 days. You know, after about three weeks, you're like, you know what? This is really chill. Internet's good. I can keep working uh, while I'm here in, in tropical paradise. Bonus, if you're a, a scuba diver, Palau is one of the, it's the seventh underwater wonder uh, of the world for a reason. There is a lot of just awesome sea life and, and undersea uh, creatures. It's a shark sanctuary, sea turtle sanctuary. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary uh, encompasses 80% of that, that economic exclusionary zone. So it's, it's a protected uh, marine sanctuary. Uh, there's uh, what Jellyfish Lake, uh, a lot of I can, I can go on and on about the diving there. I, I love diving in Palau. I I I'm, I'm, I may be biased, but I've dove in you know a couple dozen other countries. Doesn't doesn't compare. Sorry. Uh, probably <laughs> yeah. uh, the Great Mayan oh. Reef in in Mexico, yeah. off of Cozumel comes close. Uh, but yeah, Palau, Palau is just it, is great. So so if you you get to Palau, you want to stay there, then you go to the immigration office. Say hey, I, I'm, I have a digital resident ID card. Uh, here's my passport. Here's my digital resident ID card. I want to stay another 90 days. And you don't have to stay there the whole 90 days. If after 60 days you want to leave or after another month something comes up, there's no obligation. You you can go ahead and, and leave. And then once you you leave, you can come back and then do your visa on arrival, start the clock again, and then apply for your 90 days, 90 days. If you go and you stay the whole Visa on arrival plus the 290 days, then you have to you have to break up your stay uh, and leave unless there's some other situation or circumstance that the immigration regulation allows for you to stay longer. Like you you get employment or something, uh, or you lease land and say, you know what, I just want to stay here for a couple more years. So it's so it's super, super flexible. And what you mentioned is exactly the the positive feedback. Uh, and the recommendations we were getting from the digital nomad community uh, to to really simplify the change to the regulation to make it flexible for the digital nomad community. So for our listeners who are planning vacations, planning their next trip, and, and essentially, it, you know, this is a this is a form of destination marketing. It, it's funny. I was at I was at the running remote conference in Lisbon, and I'm starting to see more of destinations actively going out and, and, and undertaking the same kinds of activities that tourism boards would do. Tourism boards obviously go out and market, you know, the Costa Brava and, and Croatia and Japan and all the, in all kinds of places, Mexico, Maui, they go out and market these places as tur tourist destinations. And, you know, digital nomad and remote work destinations used to be somewhere that was that was talked about or you got information about on internet forums or on websites where other nomads were talking about it but now more and more countries and cities and destinations are actively creating campaigns so with that kind of thing in mind like we're doing destination marketing for a a practical workation going from the so the vision the vision is scuba diving tropical paradise easy high tech you you fly in in you know no hassle and you can get going and enjoying your life and enjoying the weather and enjoying the culture for a couple of months. Practically though, let's say someone's planning this. What what does it look like in terms of uh, accommodations and co working spaces? What can people expect? Is it a country that has large hotels or is it more something where you might go seek out a short term rental in someone's home? 
or are there uh, re resorts? You know, there's all, you know, we see it in, in, in places with nice, w nice weather. We see all kinds of, of strategies for accommodation all across the board from super authentic stay in someone's home to a completely purpose built, all inclusive resort. You know, when you think of Mexico or Cuba or, or that kind of thing, what right. can people expect practically in terms of, I want to spend two or three months in Palau. What, you know, budgets, budgets differ, but what, you know, on a, uh, a decent middle class, you know, uh, you know, they have to be reasonably well off and earning some income in order to go take, take a trip to Palau. But what, what can they expect from the, the ex accommodations that are available? No, it, it really runs the gamut of, of what you mentioned. Uh, there's Airbnb there. There's uh, very high five-star luxury resorts uh with with all the amenities uh, or you can rent a one bedroom apartment or a studio and go that route uh, you know where you're you're actually living there paying your own utility bill and you know you're just living as as you would anywhere else uh, everywhere has has uh internet uh cell phone service is is pretty good you, it's it's 4G is the max uh but you know depending where you're at you know there's there's wi-fi uh, that you can you can connect to uh, pretty much everywhere. Like I said, they're they're in the process of of uh, modernizing uh, the the cell phone network, and they're they they've been just constantly extending uh, the fiber optic backbone uh, everywhere. So it's it's uh it's going to be to the point where you know you land and get off the plane, and you don't even have to go. You don't have to go to the Palau National Communications. Uh, booth in the airport and get a SIM card, you know, your your phone should just switch over just like when you fly from the US to the Bahamas or, or anywhere else and, and your carrier uh, already has an agreement in place. Uh, so you, you just start roaming. Got it. Do people yeah. come to the, to um, when people visit, do they generally come and stay within uh, urban areas on the biggest island or islands or do they spread out to some of the, the you know, there, there's oh, lots yeah. of islands. It and then is it the same there. consistency of um, Borgi across all the islands? Or are there places where it's like, hey, if you want to work, you need to think about being here versus there just right. in terms of the 4G? With, with the, so the cell tower is, the cell phone network is a little bit, it's, it's different from from the, the fiber uh, network, right? So if, right, if you're... Yeah. Again, it, it just it just depends. Yeah, if you're if you're like phone call, if your if your work requires you to be on the phone a lot, then probably Karor, uh, the former capital, is the most uh, densely populated, and and they they have like uh, a lot of accommodations and hotels there. Uh, but but I'll tell you that when you know tourists come in or or digital nomads come in uh, to Palau now, it, it runs a gamut from you know they're they're either hauling all this scuba gear with camera equipment uh, or just the regular families there for family vacation or people just, you know, they, they bring nothing but a backpack and they're going to go uh, out to, you know, some of the more remote areas of Palau and, and either camp or uh, just rent. Uh, they, have, they have bungalows, uh, mangrove uh, uh, bungalows. They have uh, uh, just, just a whole, whole different, a very wide variety of uh places to live there there are over uh so so before covid we had a little over 50,000 tourists every year uh visit palau uh that that number is slowly rising i think we have we're at about 14% now of of that and with the the opening of the different air routes it it's slowly increasing uh but there's also a pretty large expat community in palau of around 2,000 expats from all over the world. Uh, so uh, it's it's very safe. It's it's they're they're very friendly to, to foreigners. It, they're very friendly to tourists. Uh, everyone's very warm, very accepting. I mean, you have your you know when when there there's almost no like capital crime in Palau. Like if if there's a a murder uh, or something of that nature, it's the big deal because like it's almost unheard of Palau is so small it's it's really you, you can't you can't I mean I, I grew up there you can't you know commit a crime and get away with it someone someone will see you and someone will tell your mom 
and then you're, you're going to be in, in big trouble. So it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a very tight knit community. They're, they're very welcoming, uh, of outsiders. They love sharing their culture and their Island. And so like, like as a, for digital nomads, I mean, it's, it's going to be one of the better, uh, experiences, I think. As maybe we get close to wrapping up here, is there anything about the cuisine or the culture of Palau that's just a, a must do? Don't miss it. Have a certain dish. Try a certain activity that uh, is is authentic and, and can really uh, help someone who's uh, if so, it's someone's, you know, first weekend in Palau. They've set up the Internet. They've walked around. They bought some groceries. They've done their, you know, they had their meetings. They're on a workation and it's Saturday and they really want to just say, I'd like to go. You know, I want to get like the, the best entry point into Palauan culture. What should they do on that 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 first weekend? So there's a uh, night market at the uh, Japan Palau Friendship Bridge. Uh, but that, that's uh, I believe it's every Friday Friday night and Saturday night, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, just you know, going there, they usually have like a lot of cultural dances, uh, you know, live entertainment, and then the, the different arts and crafts. P again, people are very friendly. You know, if you, if you strike up a conversation with them and, and you know, ask them about uh, Palau, they're, they're happy to tell you, happy to share with you. That as far as as food, I mean, there's just if if you if you love seafood, you're going to be in heaven. I mean, a, anything from uh, the you know, fresh lobsters, fresh fish, clam, you know, you name it, it, it's it's there and and it's prepared really really deliciously. in, in many of the restaurants in, in Palau, I mean, and then there's also the bazaar. Like if you're a the guy that eats the weird stuff. Uh, uh, Andrew Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. uh, they, so fruit bat is actually a, a, a very fruit bat soup is a is a, a popular dish with Palauans. And so if you're an adventurous eater and, and want to try that, uh, you can get it in in many of the 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 restaurants in Palau. The but I mean they're, they're, the the cuisine it's it's you know, there's Japanese Chinese uh, and there's a really nice Indian restaurant. Other than that, you know, any, anything you can find uh, in the U.S. Or, or other parts of the world, they'll have it in in Palau. That's an amazing place to end off this episode. Just hearing about the, the Japan and Palau friendship bridge, you know, I really, I really hope in the in the the decades to come, you know, we, Palau can grow and grow it, uh, its uh, its brand, if I can use the marketing term, but but really grow this program and have more digital nomads and remote workers come to this region, and uh, you know, in in 22 years. We'll be we'll be celebrating a hundred years of uh, friendship and peace in uh, in the in the Pacific and uh, and really seeing this part of the world become somewhere where if in a world where we all have Apple Vision Pros on our heads and we can work from anywhere, well we can work from Palau and that'll be a, a great Absolutely. place. So I've got a a bright vision of uh, visiting Palau in the coming uh, in the coming year and uh, also. Uh, Let promoting... me know where you're going. Oh yeah, I definitely will. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things. I, when I was at Running Remote in Lisbon, you know, I, I went to a presentation by the team from Buenos Aires, and I was thinking, "No, oh, Buenos Aires is interesting. I, I I may go to Argentina sometime." But then by the end of the presentation, I was like, "Oh, I, you know, I kind of want to go there sooner now because they've they've sold me on it." And I think the same thing has happened here, where if I thought I was going to Palau in the next couple of years, now it's like, "How can I go in the next year?" Just hearing about this, uh, you know, all the the progress of this program, and then just the the vision of uh, of a workation in Palau seems very enticing. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jay. I really appreciate it. Is uh, if people want to see you on the internet or follow you on the internet, is there somewhere that they should go to follow your work? Yeah, de definitely. Uh, RNS ID. That's the uh, website for where you can uh, follow and register. Uh, or just get on the ma mailing list. We have uh, over 90,000 uh, folks registered uh, on the mailing list. And then, you know, slowly but surely, they're, they're submitting their applications uh, to become digital residents. Uh, we also have a government website. It's palaugov.pw forward slash DRO. Uh, we put uh, program information and we also publish all of our 
uh, regulations that we're passing for the different services. Uh, in particular, the, uh, Im the change to the immigration regulation is on there. It spells out exactly what digital residents uh, are eligible to do now. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate the time. We'll add that to the show notes. Thanks, Jay, so much, and uh, have a great night.